I saw it, a cave mouth, small and round, in the base of the hill, and leaning against the dirt slope of the hill was a woman with a mercy rifle. All right, I whispered. Come on, let's get out of here. I pulled at Emil's arm and turned towards freedom. It was like trying to stop a warship from taking off. Emil was gone, running silently towards the cave with his gun held ready, leaving me with numb fingers and a deep appreciation of Finagle's first law. I swallowed a groan and started after him. On flat ground, I can beat any Jinxian who ever ran the short sprint. My legs were twice the length of Emil's. But Emil moved like a wraith through the alien vegetation, while I kept getting tangled up. My long legs and arms stuck out too much, and I couldn't catch him. It was such a crying pity. Because we had it. We had it all. We're all we are going to get. The guarded cave was our proof. Bellamy and his hunter friends were the kidnappers. That knowledge would be a powerful bargaining point in our negotiations for the return of Lelubi, despite what I'd told Emil. All we had to do now was get back to base and tell somebody. But I couldn't catch a meal. I couldn't even keep up with him. A bare area fronted the cave, a triangular patch of ground bounded by two thick sprawling roots belonging to a tree-like thing on the hill. I'd lost sight of a meal. When I saw him again, he was running for the cave at full speed, and the woman with the gun was face up in the dirt. Emil reached the darkness at the mouth of the cave and disappeared within. And as he vanished into the dark, he was unmistakably falling. In Beowulf Schaefer's third story, we once again find him in the company of an alien. This time, however, it's not a puppeteer. It's a Catatlino named Lulubi. They're both on a starliner from down to Kamiji. The captain of the ship, Margo, informed Beowulf that they would be making a slight detour just before reaching their destination. It seems a starseed had passed through the system, one of the only two species known to live in the vacuum of space. They were enormous, non-sentient, plant-like creatures that traveled using their bodies as solar sails. They were very rare, and so Margot had decided to use her faster-than-light hyperdrive to see back in time. The starseed had passed through the Gamiji system a month before the ship's arrival, so Margot traveled a light month out in front of the path of the starseed to peer back in time and watch it open its solar sail. Being that well folded up, the creature measured a mile across at its narrowest, and its solar sail was over a thousand miles long when deployed. It was easy to watch through the telescope image on the screen. After the ship watched the show, they prepared to make the last leg to their destination, but another ship came into their mass bubble, preventing them from going into hyperspace. And suddenly, everyone passed out. When they all regained consciousness, they found that nothing was missing from their cargo. Nothing was missing from their rooms. Then they realized that Lulubi was missing, and instantly it was clear what happened. The Catatlino species did not like to travel. They could only travel in very large spaceships because their psyche required them to be in large open spaces. They would go crazy in a confined space. Because of this, they did not like to be in spaceships. Most never traveled at all. In fact, Lulubi was one of the first of his kind to ever leave his planet willingly. Because before humans had freed them, they were a Kazinti slave race. This meant that Lulubi was very valuable as a ransom. When the ship reached Gamiji, they reported the kidnapping. But Beowulf had accidentally made friends with a wannabe hero named Emil from Jinx a man who thought he could solve the mystery better than the local authorities. But he needed Beowulf's help with the spaceport logs. Unlike Beowulf, he was not an expert in ships. So Beowulf reluctantly agreed, thinking it would lead to nothing. But when they looked at the logs and found that out of the 16 ships that had landed recently, only one could possibly be the kidnappers, 
he realized that this was not over. The single ship that could fit all the requirements was owned by an acquaintance of Beowulf's, Larkmont Bellamy, and now Emil wanted him to introduce him to Bellamy. Beowulf refused, but Emil ignored him. What was he going to do? Jump out of a flying car at Mach 4 several hundred feet above the ground? Or try to fight a Jinxian for the keys? Him, a crash lander. Jinx's gravity was around twice that of Earth's. Well, the gravity of We Made It was a fraction of Earth's. While Emil was short and stocky, Beowulf was tall and thin. Even if he stood there and let him, Beowulf's punches wouldn't hurt Emil more than a Jinxian child's. So off they flew to Bellamy's hunting camp. But as soon as they arrived, Emil's dreams of being a hero were dashed. The ship didn't fit the description Margot had given. The ship that was in their mass bubble just before they had all lost consciousness was at least twice this big. But Bellamy was an acquaintance of Beowulf's, so they stopped by and had a pleasant conversation anyway before departing. Well, semi-pleasant. All right, Bellamy said, sprawling in an armchair. When he relaxed, he relaxed totally, like a cat or a tiger. Bay, how did you come to Gamiji, and where's Cheryl? She can't travel in space. Oh, I didn't know. That can happen to anyone. But his eyes questioned. She wants children. Did you know that? She's always wanted children. He took in my red eyes and white hair. I see. So you broke up. For the time being, his eyes questioned. That's not emphatic enough. There was something about Bellamy. He had a lean body and a lean face, with a straight, sharp-edged nose and prominent cheekbones, all setting off the dark eyes and their deep pits beneath black, shaggy brows. But there was more to it than eyes. You can't tell a man's age by looking at his photo, not if he takes booster spice. But you can tell, to some extent, by watching him in motion. Older men know where they're going before they start to move. They don't dither, they don't waste energy, they don't trip over their feet, and they don't bump into things. Bellamy was old. There was a power in him, and his eyes questioned. I shrugged. We used the best answer we had, Lark. He was a friend of ours, and his name was Carlos Wu. You've heard of him? Mathematician, isn't he? Yeah, also playwright and composer. The fertility board gave him an unlimited breeding license when he was 18. That young? He's a genius. As I say, he was a good friend of ours, liked to talk about space. He had the flatland phobia, like Cheryl. Well, Cheryl and I made our decision, and then we went to him for help. He agreed. So Cheryl's married him on a two-year contract. In two years, I'll go back and marry her, and we'll raise our family. I'll be damned. I'd been angry about it for too long, with nobody to be angry at. I flared up. Well, what would you have done? Found another woman. But I'm a dirty old man, and you're young and naive. Suppose Wu tried to keep her. He won't. He's a friend. I told you. Besides, he's got more women than ten of him could handle with that license of his. So you left. I had to. I couldn't stand it. He was looking at me with something like awe. I can't remember ever being in love that hard, Bay. And you're overdue for a drunk. And you're around friends. Shall we switch to something stronger than beer? Beowulf turned down the beer. He had not come to pour his heart out to Bellamy. Bellamy just had that kind of effect on people. So they changed subjects and then eventually departed as the sun began to set. But, to Emil's surprise, Beowulf suddenly dropped the car down low and circled back around towards the camp. Something Bellamy had said was off. He was there to hunt, but not with the hunting group. He was at his ship, and when Beowulf had asked to come along on the hunt, he was turned down. It didn't sit right with Beowulf. It felt like a lie, so he investigated. What they found was the residue of dust covering the treetops for miles around. Bellamy must have used a disintegrator to dig a hole to hide his kidnap victim in. A very large one, so that the Cadatlino would not go insane. 
When a disintegrator is used, it breaks whatever it is aimed at down on the atomic level, spreading atomic dust into the air. This, combined with the wind, created a barely visible arrow aiming directly at the cave that could be seen from a high altitude. Now Beowulf knew he had been lied to. Emil and Beowulf land and try to sneak up to the cave. I saw it. A cave mouth, small and round, in the base of the hill. And leaning against the dirt slope of the hill was a woman with a mercy rifle. All right, I whispered. Come on. Let's get out of here. I pulled at Emil's arm and turned towards freedom. It was like trying to stop a warship from taking off. Emil was gone, running silently towards the cave with his gun held ready, leaving me with numb fingers and a deep appreciation of Finagle's first law. I swallowed a groan and started after him. On flat ground, I can beat any Jinxian who ever ran the short sprint. My legs were twice the length of Emil's. But Emil moved like a wraith through the alien vegetation, while I kept getting tangled up. My long legs and arms stuck out too much, and I couldn't catch him. It was such a crying pity. Because we had it. We had it all. Or all we were going to get. The guarded cave was our proof. Bellamy and his hunter friends were the kidnappers. That knowledge would be a powerful bargaining point in our negotiations for the return of Lelubi, despite what I'd told Emil. All we had to do now was get back to base and tell somebody. But I couldn't catch a meal. I couldn't even keep up with him. A bare area fronted the cave, a triangular patch of ground bounded by two thick sprawling roots belonging to a tree-like thing on the hill. I'd lost sight of a meal. When I saw him again, he was running for the cave at full speed, and the woman with the gun was face up in the dirt. Emil reached the darkness at the mouth of the cave and disappeared within. And as he vanished into the dark, he was unmistakably falling. Well, now they had Emil. With blazing lasers, proof wasn't enough. He'd decided to bring back Lelubi himself. Now we'd have to negotiate for the two of them. Would we? Bellamy was back at the hunting camp. When he found out his men had Emil, He'd know I was somewhere around, but whoever was in the cave might think Emil was alone, in which case they might kill him right now. I settled my back against the tree. As a kind of afterthought, I focused the dueling pistol on the woman and fired. I'd have to do that every ten minutes to keep her quiet. Eventually, someone would be coming out to see why she hadn't stopped Emil. I didn't dare try to enter the cave. Be it man or booby trap, Whatever had stopped Emil would stop me. Too bad the dueling pistols didn't have more power. The craftsmen who had carved their emerald butts had scaled them down because, after all, they would be used only to prove a point. It would take a shop full of tools to readjust them, because readjusting them to their former power would violate Jinxian law. Real police stunners will knock a man out for 12 hours or more. I was sitting there, waiting for someone to come out, when I felt the prickly numbness of a stunner. So now Bellamy and his kidnap group had both Emil and Beowulf, and all Beowulf had going for him was that Bellamy had not yet figured out that he was only shot with a dueling stunner, not a police stunner. Bellamy was expecting Beowulf to be out for hours, not minutes. But how would that help Beowulf? As he began to regain control of his body, he tried not to move. But he couldn't stay there forever, and he couldn't escape with them all carrying weapons. There was no way out. Then, suddenly, Lelubi attacked one of the men, and in the commotion, Beowulf got out of the cave unnoticed. But he was soon pursued. He tried to hide, but then realized that all they had to do was find his car and wait for him there, so he began to try and sneak in that direction. I stood just within the forest, sucking wind, nerving myself to run out into the fern grass. Then Bellamy emerged to my left. He dog-trotted fearlessly out onto the veldt, into the fern grass, and stood looking around. One of Emil's sonics dangled from one hand. He must have known by then that it was only a dueling pistol, but it was the only sonic he had. He saw something to his right, something hidden from me by a curve of forest. He turned and trotted towards it. I followed as best I could. 
Multicolored things kept tripping me, and I didn't dare step out onto the fern grass. Bellamy was going to get there first. He was examining the car when I found him. The car was right out in the open, tens of yards from any cover. Any second now, he'd get in and take off. What was he waiting for? Me? I knelt behind a magenta bush, dithering. Bellamy was peering into the back seat. He wanted to know just what we'd planned before he made his move. Every two seconds, his head would pop up for a long, slow look around. A black dot in the distance caught my eye. It took me a moment to realize that it was in the plastic goggles, blotting out the dot of actinic sunlight. The sun was right on the horizon. Bellamy was opening the trunk. The sun? I started circling, the magenta bushes offering some cover, and I used it all. Bellamy's eyes maintained their steady sweep, but they hadn't found me yet. Abruptly, he slammed the trunk, circled the car to get in. I was where I wanted to be. My long shadow pointed straight at the car. I charged. He looked up as I started. He looked straight at me, and then his eyes swept the curve of the forest, taking their time. He bent to get into the car, and then he saw me. But his gun hand was in the car, and I was close enough. The dots on his goggles had covered more than CY Aquarii. They'd covered my approach. My shoulder knocked him spinning away from the car, and I heard a metal tick. He got up fast, empty-handed, no gun. He dropped it. I turned to look in the car, fully expecting to find it on the floor or on the seat. It was nowhere to be seen. I looked back in time to duck, and his other hand caught me and knocked me away. I rolled with it and came to my feet. He was standing in a relaxed boxer's stance between me and the car. I'm going to break you, Bay. So you can't find the gun either? I don't need it. Any normal ten-year-old could break you in two. And come on. I dropped into a boxer's stance, thanking Finagle that he didn't know karate or ju its or any of the other illegal killing methods. Hundreds of years had passed since the usual laws against carrying a concealed weapon were extended to cover special fighting methods, but Bellamy had had hundreds of years to learn. I'd come up lucky. He came towards me, moving lightly and confidently, a flatlander in prime condition. He must have felt perfectly safe. What could he have to fear from an attenuated weakling, a man born and raised in We Made It's .6G? He grinned when he was almost in range, and I hit him in the mouth. My range was longer than his. He danced back, and I danced forward and hit him in the nose before he got his guard up. He'd have to get used to the extra reach of my arms. But his guard was up now, and I saw no point in punching his forearms. You're a praying mantis, he said. An insect, over-specialized, and he moved in. I moved back, punching lightly, staying out of his reach. He'd have to get used to that too. His legs were too short. If he tried to move forward as fast as I backpedaled, he wouldn't be able to keep his guard up. He tried anyway. I caught him one below the ribs, and his head jerked up in surprise. I wasn't hurting him much, but he'd been expecting love pats. Four years in Earth's 1.0G had put muscle on me, muscle that didn't show along my long bones. He tried overcrowding me, and I caught him twice in the right eye. He kept keeping his guard intact, and that was suicide because he couldn't reach me at all. I caught that eye a third time. He bellowed, lowered his head, and charged. I ran like a thief. I'd led him in a half circle. He never had a chance to catch me. He reached the car just as I slammed the door in his face and locked it. By the time he reached the left-hand door, I had that locked too, and all the windows up. He was banging a rock on the window when I turned on the lift units and departed the field of battle. He'd have to get used to my methods of fighting, too. As I took the car up, I saw him running back towards the hunting camp. But Bellamy wasn't done yet. He didn't have a car to chase in, but he did have something better. His spaceship. Bellamy did not want to get charged with murder, so rather than use his fusion drive on Beowulf, he tried to fly past and use his shockwave to knock Beowulf out of the sky, leaving no evidence. But Beowulf wasn't going to let him get off unscathed. Beowulf knew that he had no chance and he was going to die. But the least he could do was leave some evidence of what happened. 
and in a suicidally reckless maneuver, he ran into the much larger and sturdier spaceship himself. It was a glancing blow, but Beowulf was still instantly knocked unconscious. He woke up on the ground with broken hands, the only part of him that had been outside the crash field when it activated. Bellamy landed his ship nearby and came over to finish off the injured Beowulf. He came down the ladder with his eyes fixed on mine and Emil's sonic in his hand. He stepped out into the fern grass, walked over to the car, and peered in through the bent windshield frame. Come on out. I can't use my hands. So much the better. Bellamy rested the sonic on the rim of the frame and pointed it at my face. With his other hand, he reached in to unfasten the crash web and pulled me out by the arm. Walk, he said, or be dragged. I could walk, barely. I could keep walking because he kept prodding the small of my back with the gun. You've helped me, you know. You had a car crash, he said. You and Jilson, then some predators found you. It sounded reasonable. I kept walking. We were halfway to the ship when I saw it. The anomaly. I said, Bellamy, what's holding your ship up? He prodded me. Walk. Your gyros. That's what's holding the ship up. He prodded me without answering. I walked. Any moment now, he'd see it. What the? He'd seen it. He stared in pure amazement, and then he ran. I stuck out a foot to trip him, lost my balance, and fell on my face. Bellamy passed me without a glance. One of the landing legs wasn't down. I'd smashed it into the hall. He hadn't seen it on the indicators, so I must have smashed the sensors too. The odd thing was that we'd both missed it, though it was the leg facing us. The drunkard's walk stood on two legs, wildly unbalanced, like a ballet dancer halfway through a leap. Only her gyros held her monstrous mass against gravity. Somewhere in her belly they must be spinning faster and faster. I could hear the whine now, high-pitched, rising. Bellamy reached the ladder and started up. He'd have to use the steering jets now, and quickly. With steering jets that size, the gyros, which served more or less the same purpose, must be small, little more than an afterthought. Now was my chance. I struggled to my feet and staggered a few steps. Bellamy looked down, then ignored me. He'd take care of me when he had time. Where could I go? Where could I hide on this flat plane? Some chance. I stopped walking. Bellamy had almost reached the airlock when the ship screamed like a wounded god. The gyros had taken too much punishment. The metal scream must have been the death agony of the mountings. Bellamy stopped. He looked down, and the ground was too far. He looked up, and there was no time. Then he turned and looked at me. I read his mind then, though I'm no telepath. Bay, what'll I do? I had no answer for him. The ship screamed, and I hit the dirt. Well, I didn't hit it. I allowed myself to collapse. I was on the way down when Bellamy looked at me, and in the next instant the drunkard's walk spun end for end, shrieking. The nose gouged a narrow furrow in the soil, but the landing legs came down hard, dug deep and held. Bellamy sailed high over my head and I lost him in the sky. The ship poised, braced against her landing legs, taking spin from her dying flywheels. Then she jumped, the landing legs acting like springs, hurling her somersaulting into the air. She landed and jumped again, screaming, tumbling, like a wounded jackrabbit trying to flee the hunter. I wanted to cry. I'd done it. I was guilty. No ship should be killed like this. Somewhere in her belly, the gyroscope flywheels were coming to rest in a tangle of torn metal. The ship landed and rolled, bouncing, rolling. I watched as she receded, and finally, the drunkard's walk came to rest, dead, far across the blue-green veldt. I stood up and started walking. I passed Bellamy on the way. If you'd like to imagine what he looked like, go right ahead. It was nearly dark when I reached the ship. Hey, thanks for watching. 
I really appreciate you staying this long, and since you did, hopefully that means you like my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you would like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe, so I can see you back here for the next one. Take care.